tonight in uh, lecture number four of this uh, module called The Big Picture. We're going to look at Jesus. And I trust us as we go along that uh, more of the picture will come to light and will be filled in as it were. We have sketched the outline uh, in some of the other modules that we've been looking at so far. But now in this module we take a step back to get that picture that bigger picture of what God is doing in this world. And as we look at Jesus Christ tonight, I want to remind you, first of all, that the New Testament, in fact, ultimately the Bible, is about Jesus Christ, as Jesus fulfills the purposes of God. This is the way Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. It's a wonderful description of, of our position before God. He calls us sons, He calls us heirs, but it's only possible, and only possible because Jesus came into this world. And I so like this reference in Galatians 4.4, 4, where Paul says, and uh, to quote another translation, in the fullness of time. In other words, in God's economy. And God is above time and beyond time, so He's not bound by time. But in the fullness of time, when time had fully come, to quote the NIV translation, God sent His Son. And, and that is the, the crux of the matter. That's the center of everything that we're talking about, really. So tonight, as we talk about Jesus Christ and what He has come to do, who He is and what He's come to do, and where we fit into that picture, I don't want you to lose sight of that particular statement, uh, that, that truth. The, the New Testament, as I said, is about Jesus Christ. So, in a certain sense, you can open up any page of the New Testament and you'll read about Jesus, what He's come to do, who He is, and how we fit into that picture. And so, making a selection, even by way of a, a short introductory devotion, is very difficult. But let me read you the way Hebrews puts this. He says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers, through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, to quote Paul again, in the fullness of time, or when time had reached its fullness, in God's timing, in these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty in heaven. So, so He became as much superior to the angels as the name He has inherited is superior to theirs. I can go on and expand and, and talk about probably every single phrase in these four verses at the start of the book of Hebrews. And I have read Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. But it's just a description of Jesus and who He is and how mighty He is, how glorious He is. The fact that He is God, the fact that He was part of creation, that He was uh, the one who created it all. The Hebrew says the one who sustains it all. And then the author says the one through whom God is now speaking uh, in our generation. And, and so you can page to 1 Peter chapter 3. And Peter is talking about uh, our position in Christ. He's talking about suffering and the difficulties we face uh, in this world. And then he says, uh, in terms of our suffering, he says it's better uh, if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And then he gives this explanation for that. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom He also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. 
and then he talks about the salvation through the ark and he makes an application to baptism in the New Testament era and he goes on and he says about baptism and the cleansing of, uh, of our inner spirit. He says it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ in verse 21. Verse 22, Jesus who has gone into heaven and is at, the, at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. That's the position of Jesus Christ right now. And in a short little summary, and, and this is not the only place in the New Testament where we find that kind of summary. You turn to Philippians chapter 2, and, and Paul talks about Jesus who left everything to come into this world, took on the nature of a slave, a human, and died on the cross. And therefore God exalted him. And in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it goes on and on. If you page to the book of Revelation, it's almost like that whole picture is, is bound together when you see the Lamb, uh, the Lamb who is the only one worthy to open up the scrolls and to unveil and reveal what history, uh, what God's history has in store for us. And so it goes on and on and on. And tonight, uh, as we talk about Jesus Christ, I want to invite you into that understanding that deeper understanding of who Jesus is and what he has come to do for us and then more specifically right at the end how that applies to us and what how how Jesus has died to save us and our position in Christ as a result of that so let's pray together and then we'll get into the lecture time father we thank you that you are God we thank you that you revealed yourself to us as God the father and God the son and God the holy spirit and tonight, Lord, I pray that you would open up our ears, our eyes, our hearts to receive your truth, the truth about Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we focus on, on Jesus as a person and on Jesus, the work that he has come to do here on earth. I pray that you would give us open hearts to receive and to understand, and then also the ability to apply these truths to our own lives. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Also, as we seek to serve you and to get to know you better, to live closer to you, and to, to look at the implications of these truths in our own lives, we pray for your blessing upon us, because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The picture that we have been looking at so far is understanding, first of all, that there is a God. We believe in God. We believe that God created the universe, and that means ultimately to make it very personal that God is also my creator, that he created me. But as I look at nature, uh, as I look at the universe, I see God's handiwork. We also believe that God took the first step, the initiative, by revealing himself. The very fact that he created the universe is part of God's revelation. But then God also pursued us by revealing more and more of himself and we talked about progressive revelation. And tonight as we uh, zero in on Jesus Christ and, and uh, the New Testament where we read about Jesus, uh, we know that this is the final revelation of God. Jesus is God's final revelation. And progressively God has revealed more about himself. And where we are today, 2,000 years after Jesus, uh, after he came to this world, we know that uh, Jesus represents that that center of God's revelation and the, the pivotal uh, revelation of God, the, uh, the ultimate revelation of God. God created mankind. Uh, we looked at that uh, last week and, and what that means in terms of uh, we, we created being created in the image of God and then how we sinned against God and how the image of God has been marred or damaged in us and, and yet every person in this world uh, because we are created in God's image, still has part of that image of God in us. We also looked at uh, spiritual beings. Uh, there's a spiritual world, a spiritual reality out there that we can't touch and see with our physical eyes, but it's something that the Bible speaks about, and we believe that God created all of that. So last week, more specifically, we affirmed our belief that God created human beings. We call that the study of biblical anthropology, uh, we saw how Adam and Eve, uh, as representatives of the human race, fell into sin. And therefore, every human being born, uh, since then, is born in sin. And we talk about original sin. But we also 
uh, talked about God pursuing us. And then throughout, of, uh, throughout the whole of the Old Testament and the New Testament, God continues to reveal more about Himself, pursuing us uh, to offer us salvation and to bring us back to Himself. We confirm that God created angels, some of whom went astray and became enemies of God under the headship of Satan. Uh, and that's the whole spiritual world, both good angels and, and bad demons or bad angels. Um, and we believe that they are there to serve, serve God's creation and serve God's purposes. Um, much more about the angelic world or the spiritual world we don't know. And I appealed to you last week that we stay within the scriptures when we talk about the spiritual world especially. And that is critical, especially when we start talking about uh, what the spiritual world is and how that operates. Now tonight we're going to look at God's uh, response to hum humanity's fall. Uh, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, God continued to pursue them. The ultimate uh, example or the ultimate proof of that is the fact that Jesus came into this world and He died on the cross for our sins. So we'll focus on the person of Jesus, who He is. We'll focus on the work of Jesus, what He came to do. And then we'll look at the application of what Christ has come to do in terms of our own salvation. Psalm 110 uh, is a beautiful psalm to read to understand more about Jesus from an Old Testament perspective. And so is Isaiah chapter 53. Um, we believe that that is a, a very specific prophecy about Jesus and His death and His dying. And so when you read through that, it's almost like Isaiah was there at the cross, uh, as it were. From a New Testament perspective, John uh, 1, 2, and 3, Hebrews, the first five chapters. In fact, Hebrews is one of those books in the New Testament that really gives us perspective on the interpretation of Jesus and what He came to do. If you want to know more about Jesus and what He did physically, then of course the Gospels are there. Uh, all of the Synoptic Gospels, John's Gospel, is a very specific uh, perspective or gives us a very specific perspective because He takes an angle of, of Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Son of God, uh, who came into this world to take away the sins of the world. Colossians chapter 1 is another reference I could have read earlier on tonight, uh, just in terms of understanding who Jesus is, and then chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. The story continues, uh, because we've looked at God, we've looked at creation, the creation of mankind, and then the fall of mankind, and God's response to the fall. Uh, that's where we have ended last time. When we go to the Genesis story, Genesis chapter, chapters 1 and 2 introduce us to God as that creator. Everything is good. Uh, God created it to reflect His glory. God remains involved uh, with His creation. That's why He communed with Adam and Eve as He came into, um, into the garden to uh, seek their fellowship, if you wish. Uh, not that he needed that for his own existence, but by his grace, he sought them out. We also learn that everything that God created, including mankind, is good. Nothing in creation is, was created bad. Uh, creation went bad. And that is introduced to us by Genesis chapter 3. The beautiful, wonderful uh, Eden, Garden of Eden picture in chapter 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2, uh, is suddenly marred when... Uh, humankind fell into sin, and Eve and Adam gave in to the temptation. And uh, they represented humanity, represented us, uh, and all of humanity, and therefore everyone is born into sin. It doesn't take long, as we saw last week, for um, even a young child born with original sin to start acting upon sin, and uh, that's true of every single one of us. It doesn't take long for any one of us to be convinced that we are uh, not evil in nature, but we have evil desires. Uh, and that is written in the Scriptures everywhere. How God responded to Adam, uh, one would expect that God would have turned his back on humanity or that he would have rejected creation. That's what I would have done if I were God. Fortunately, I'm not God. And God, by His grace, knew what was happening uh, there's nothing is, is uh, secret to God or held from God's view or His knowledge. But when God came looking for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eve and after they have sinned, that was already the first indication uh, 
after the fall of mankind that God by His grace has not rejected His own creation. But He came after creation pursuing His own uh, creation, remaining involved and showing His grace to them. His acts of kindness are found in the Genesis uh, story um, as a reflection of His character. God by, by His nature is love. We have seen that uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, God by nature is full of grace full of mercy, and He always reaches out to us and always will continue to reach out to His own creation. And so that is the rest of the story of the Bible. So when you pick up the Bible, uh, you read chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, and from that point on, it is God pursuing humanity. A humanity who has fallen into sin. It doesn't matter where you open the Bible. The, there's some a aspect or angle to the story of humanity that has fallen uh, into sin. And so tonight, in a, in a real sense, we're coming to the highlight of God's pursuing, uh, God's, God's pursuance or God pursuing His own creation. In God's omniscience, knowing everything, God was aware of the fact that Adam and Eve sinned. And uh, in His um, omnipotence, His all power, He could have just clicked His finger or said a word or whatever, even a thought. Uh, in his mind would have wiped it all out and said let's start over again but I am so grateful when I look back to know that God by his grace and by his mercy decided not to do that but to continue to pursue his creation God uh, when he came to Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden we see that in Genesis chapter 3 dealt harshly with sin and God continues to deal harshly with sin in fact, Jesus on the cross is the ultimate proof of how God deals with sin. God never turns a blind eye. And, and as much as we often would like for that to happen, we would like to think that God simply just needs to turn a blind eye. Just forget the fact that I have actually sinned. God never does that. Because the, God recognizes sin for what it is. It is evil. It is opposed to God. And, and it needs God's forgiveness. And therefore God established a pattern throughout the whole of the Old Testament and ultimately in the New Testament for reaching out to sinners like you and I to forgive us. And he dealt harshly with sin in Genesis chapter 3 by saying to Adam and Eve that from that point on they will suffer the consequences of their sin. But on the one hand God dealt harshly with sin, with the other hand God uh, shared His grace and His mercy and His love with them. He prepared clothes for them to cover their nakedness, for suddenly they realized that they are naked, and they felt and stood guilty before God. God also set certain rules in place, boundaries. Um, we may refer to those as laws. And in the Old Testament, they found their expression in the laws that God gave to Israel, regulating their behavior, helping them through the laws to live in a way that would ultimately bring glory to His name. And then He promised salvation. And in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 3, most scholars see in Genesis chapter 3 already the reference to the way that God it was going to deal somewhere in the future with humanity. And He talks about the serpent. And He says, because you have done this, and that is tempt... Um, the woman and she tempted the man and both Adam and Eve fell into sin. He says, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl in your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. The actual word here is seed and in the older translations you will find the word seed. I will put enmity between um, you and the woman between your seed and hers and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And so in a certain sense, God was promising, for, uh, looking forward to what was going to happen for ages to come. And that is this battle between evil and good. Uh, evil represented by the serpent, the devil, Satan, and he will strike out uh, at humanity, but Jesus ultimately re representing um, human or humankind in its perfect form. And so here already most scholars see a prophecy to Jesus coming 
and how Satan will attack him, a picture that we find described in symbolic language ultimately in the book of Revelation, and then how the seed of the woman uh, or the offspring of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And that was fulfilled, we believe, when Jesus died on the cross and when he rose from the dead, he, he crushed the devil and therefore victory was won on the cross and when Jesus rose from the dead. And we now live in that victory. And so here already in, in Genesis we have a, a forecast that we, from a New Testament perspective, can look back and, and see its fulfillment as it happened in Jesus Christ. Now, throughout the rest of the Bible, we do get to know God as a Savior. And this is a very important um, concept that we need to understand. Uh, I have said this in different contexts before, but here is another opportunity just to affirm the fact that God, the God of the Old Testament, is the exact same God as the one in the New Testament. It's not a different God. And so already in the Old Testament, although uh, what happens fairly regularly is God punishing or judging uh, the nation of Israel and other nations, God is also a Savior. And it is God the Savior who reaches out to Adam and Eve. It is God the Savior who calls Israel to become His people. It is God the Savior who sends Jesus into this world to come and die uh, for our sins. So we need to understand that as the story of salvation. If we look at salvation from an Old Testament perspective, then using an Old, uh, Old Testament or an, an ancient sacrificial system that was well known to people in the ancient world back then. God instituted a way or a method to attain forgiveness of sins. Now, when we look at, at the Old Testament era, one of the questions I, I often ask students is, um, how were people saved in the Old Testament? Inevitably, uh, one person or, or people would put up their hands and say, through the sacrifices. So by offering sacrifices or by keeping the law. Now, that in essence is the wrong answer. It wasn't by keeping the law that people were saved. They were saved because they placed their faith in God. And that, in the New Testament, has uh, reaches its full description. When we now understand, when we place our faith in Jesus, that is when we are really saved. It's not because we try hard. It's not because we go to church. It's not because we give money to the church or do good deeds. It's essentially and, 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 and ultimately and only because we believe in Jesus Christ, because I put my faith in Him. And that's the exact same way people were saved in the Old Testament. They were saved because they placed their faith in God, their trust in God. So where, do, where does the law fit into that picture? The law fits in in that people needed to exercise faith in God you needed to believe that God created the universe and created me. You need to believe that there is a God who will hold me accountable. And then you need to believe that this God has given a law, uh, some regulations by which I would now be able to find salvation. And so if people in the Old Testament approached God in sincerity and in faith, by faith, he then forgave their sins. God instituted the law and used a sacrificial system to explain to them and to bring uh, some kind of symbolic way to their minds so that they could understand that this is taking away their sins. So it's not essentially by keeping the law, but by putting their faith in God. The law is there to help them uh, express their faith. And, and even in, from a New Testament perspective, although we are not bound by certain rules and regulations, we, we still, even after we put our faith in Christ, we're still not free just to live any which way and to go on sinning. In fact, there is the law of Christ, as the New Testament calls it. And that law says to us that we need to live holy lives, not by making a list of rules and regulations, such as the Old Testament, but by expressing our faith in Christ by living a life that is to the glory of God. So, way back in the Old Testament already we have this promise, the promise that there was going to be a Messiah. That is an underlying theme throughout the whole of the Old Testament. God is, was going to send someone. Moses said that. Here in Genesis 3 we find a reference to that. 
Moses said that God was going to raise up a prophet like me, referring to himself. And again, we believe that the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy uh, was in Jesus Christ. As we have said on different occasions and different contexts and different in the, some of the other modules, prophecy had multiple fulfillments. Um, and so, obviously, there were prophets who came in the footsteps of Moses. Uh, others who were sort of like Moses. But ultimately, we believe that fulfillment uh, was reached in Jesus Christ. And the, the goal of God was to bring people back to himself. Now, this figure that is referred to in the Old Testament, this Messiah figure, is referred to as the seed of the woman here in Genesis 3. He's referred to as a leader, the leader for my people, a Messiah. And, and more specifically, during the intertestamental period, the Jewish scholars poured over the Scriptures and studied it and tried to learn what it is that God has said. And, and a very, very strong messianic expectation grew during that time. And so they were expecting a Messiah. And sadly, today, still today, Jews believe that there is still a Messiah or the Messiah to come somewhere in the future. Christians believe Jesus is that Messiah. And messianic Jews believe that Jesus is the one who came, who was promised in the Old Testament. He is referred to as the seed of David, the son of David. Uh, the Son of Man uh, in the book of Daniel. Uh, and so several of those references in the Old Testament referred uh, to some person, some uh, figure who was going to come in the future. In the Old Testament, we only see glimpses of the, uh, that future reality. It is in the book of Ezekiel, uh, which I want to just highlight very briefly, uh, that we find uh, a sort of a summary of the kind of thing that we find in the Old Testament, an expectation of better times to come. And this is the way Ezekiel describes it. He says, um, Ezekiel 36, verse 24, For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave to your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your unclean, uh, uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. Vivid pictures of a nation who serves God and a future reality where God is essentially saying to uh, the nation through Ezekiel who lived during the fall of Jerusalem and was in exile himself in Babylon that there is a future reality which is going to be far more glorious than the one that you're experiencing right now. Up to that point in time they've been living in the land for um, from about 12, 1300 B.C., uh, now we're talking about the middle of that, um, of that first uh, millennium uh, before Christ. And we're talking about people uh, who have not served God. They have revealed themselves as people with a heart of stone. And there is the law, and they couldn't even keep the law, and the law didn't satisfy them properly. So always there was this future reality or a promise of someone that was going to come. All of those fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. When we look at the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we're talking about a study that theologians call Christology. And the, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this one out. It comes from the Greek word Christos, uh, which we also use for our word for Jesus Christ or Christ. And so Christology is the study or the doctrine uh, of Christ. Some of the key beliefs uh, about Jesus, which I will put on the screen, uh, all, of, all of that um, in, in one shot, uh, in brief, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, we looked at the Trinity when we uh, looked at, at, the, at the study of theology proper. We believe that Jesus became a human being, that he was born of the Virgin Mary. We believe that he lived and ministered in Israel for about three years or so after he uh, turned about 30 years of age. He preached the kingdom of God. He performed many miracles to prove the power of God 
in this world and what God's ultimately wanting to do in establishing His kingdom by, by bringing people into a, a healthy relationship with God and living healthy lifestyles. He was crucified for our sins. He rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He rules over the principalities and the angels, as Peter puts it, uh, and several other places in the Bible. And there is the promise of Jesus coming again somewhere in the future. So that gives you a brief summary of the kind of thing that we're going to look at now. When we look at the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, He is the Son of God. In terms of His identity, we have said earlier on uh, in our first lecture, we believe in God. I believe in God. Now, when we talk about the identity of Jesus, He is the second person of the Trinity. He is eternally existent as God the Son. The Son of God, the, the term Son of God refers to His origin and His nature. When you turn to uh, the Bible, oftentimes the word Son of so-and-so does not necessarily mean uh, that I have a surname. It really means that I am of that sort of origin. Um, I am of a South African or I'm a son of Africa. Sometimes people would refer to meaning I, I'm, I come from Africa. That's my origin. And when we talk about the Son of God, we're talking about Jesus as originating with God. Not, not in the sense that He started somewhere because as God He was eternally existent. But it does talk about where He came from and the nature of Jesus Christ. Jesus is active, was active in, in creation. Uh, that we learn from the New Testament because the Old Testament doesn't explain that to us in so many words. But He was present in the Old Testament era mostly in an assumed or in an implicit way and then fully revealed in the New Testament. This is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. When we look at the divinity of Christ, the Son of God, Everything we learn about Jesus in the Bible points to His divine existence. How do we know that? Well, there's so many different things, but let me give you just a quick summary of, uh, of, or, or a highlight of some of the references in the Bible. He is fully God. He is, in the, full image, he is the full image of God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, as one of your prescribed readings, uh, but it is very, very clear from, from this reference that Jesus is God. In fact, there are many others that I also can read. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. 2 verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. There is no doubt with the New Testament authors that Jesus was God, that He is the full image of God, and that we can come to know or get to know God by getting to know Jesus Christ. Jesus was called Lord uh, in, by His contemporaries. Um, oftentimes people called Him Lord. I, I need to put that in perspective because the word Lord can also mean Sir. Uh, or mister. And so to be fair to that particular word, the word is kurios, uh, you can use the word in a more generic sense. But the context in the New Testament oftentimes, uh, more often than not, suggests that the word is used in a more uh, respectful way. Uh, when you turn to the letters, well, when you turn to the Gospels, oftentimes people will come and they bow before Jesus and they call Him Lord. Thomas called him my Lord and my God, or my God and my Lord. Um, in, the, in the letters, again and again, the reference to Jesus is as our Lord Jesus Christ. And this, this word, kurios, or Lord, is the word that is used by the Greek translation of the Old Testament when there is a reference to Yahweh or to Adonai, both of which also in our, new, in our uh, English translations are translated as Lord, either capital letters L-O-R-D or capital L and then small or lowercase O-R-D. Jesus is referred to as the Word, and then John says and adds to that, and the Word was God. Um, and very clearly, John uh, identified Him as God. He identified Himself with the unique name of God, the I Am. Uh, 
one of the best examples of that. In fact, the real uh, highlight of, of the I am statements we find in the book of John. When Jesus was talking to the Jews, which we have to put in inverted commas, not all the Jews simultaneously, but obviously the Jews rep that were represented by their leadership. In John chapter 8, verse 57, uh, the Jews, uh, Jesus was just saying that I have, that Abraham saw my days and re he rejoiced in that. Um, you are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And when Jesus said that, and he was obviously speaking Aramaic, which is closely related to the, related to the Hebrew that we have in the Old Testament. And when Jesus was saying that, he was identifying himself with the, with the I am who I am name that God took upon himself or called himself when Moses asked for the name of God. And so it's no wonder that the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. He was standing uh, in the most holy place in Israel on the temple grounds and he called himself by this name I am. And so he was identifying himself as God. Uh, he has the same titles as God. When you go to the book of Revelation, both God, uh, the one on the throne, and the Lamb of God, the Son, uh, are called the Alpha and the Omega, just to use one example. There are plenty of other examples that I can use. But there is no doubt in the minds of the New Testament authors that Jesus Christ is God, that He was and that He is divine. But there is also a human side to Jesus that we need to be uh, aware of and take note of. Uh, so from His divine point of view, uh, we talk about, we refer to the Son of God. But Jesus also refers to Himself as the Son of Man, quoting Daniel's use, usage of that word. There is no doubt that Jesus was a human being. He, was, uh, he is given a human genealogy. Now, of course, we know that He was born of a virgin Mary. But when the ge genealogy is quoted, um, there, are, there, there are two different ones um, by Matthew and by Luke. And in, um, we, we find that it, it goes all the way back to David and to Adam. Um, and there is a, a clear indication that the, the authors of the New Testament experienced him as a normal human being uh, who lived among them. His fetal development and birth happened in the normal way. Um, his conception was miraculous, as we, as we refer to that normally. He did normal human things. He grew up. He was obedient to his parents. He related to people. He ate. Uh, he slept. He walked. He touched uh, different people. Uh, there was no doubt that he was a human being. He suffered. He bled. And he died. Uh, and that is what human beings do. He showed human limitations. He was tired. When he spoke to the woman at the well, he didn't go into the city with the disciples. He had to rest a bit because he was tired. It was in the middle of the day. He was hungry. He was thirsty. Uh, he had some lack of knowledge. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 says that even the Son of Man does not know the coming of, of the Christ uh, eventually when these things are gonna, going to happen. So somehow he had limitations in his knowledge. He experienced human emotions. Um, he was angry at times. He loved. He, ha he showed sorrow. He cried tears. He had compassion over people. All of those are human emotions uh, that we see in the life of Jesus. So two things we need to understand about Jesus. One, that he was God, and the other is that he was human. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. A couple of peculiarities when we talk about Christ's humanity and when He lived here on earth. The one is that He participated in public and private worship, praying to His Father. But at the same time, He received worship. And so it's a bit of a, almost a contradiction in terms, if you wish. Uh, on the one hand, He worshipped, but on the other hand, He was worshipped. So it's a bit of a, a, a difficult thing to get our, our minds around. He willingly laid down some of his divine qualities. Perhaps we can say he restricted some of his divine qualities, such as I just mentioned. The fact that he uh, had limited knowledge. The fact that he, as God, would have been spirit, because God is spirit. But now he took upon himself a human body in order to serve humanity. Philippians chapter 2, I already referred to, uh, where he, um, in fact, Paul, uh, Paul says it uh, 
very well in that passage, and perhaps I, I should read that uh, quickly. In uh, Philippians chapter 2, he says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Um, and and the, the meaning there is something such as uh, he did not insist on, on, on holding on to his divine nature. Something like that interpretation could be applied to he, uh, he uh, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to be held on to. Because Paul then goes on to say, but he made himself nothing. And the literal translation of that is he emptied himself. In other words, he willingly laid down his, some of his divine qualities in order to take a human body and to come and serve us as human sinners here on earth. Jesus was tempted just like any other human being. Uh, we know that for certain. The, the book of Hebrews points that out in Hebrews chapter 4. He was tempted like any other human being. And then the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, include uh, a description of Jesus in the desert and where he was tempted uh, and faced many uh, three temptations uh, from the devil. He seemed to have had the potential or the ability to sin. Otherwise, the temptations would have made no sense whatsoever. And, and often scholars or theologians argue about this. Uh, was it possible uh, for Jesus? Was it within his ability to sin? And the answer to that would be in the affirmative, because otherwise the temptations would make no sin, uh, would, would, would make no sense uh, whatsoever. We all know the verse, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Now, in that one verse, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Jesus is divine. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He is divine. But He also became a human being. He's the Son of God, but He's also the Son of Man, uh, representing God's love for this world. Uh, something had to happen, something very special had to happen to save humanity. And that something special happened in Jesus Christ. Now, the debate about these two things, uh, on the one hand, Jesus being God, and on the other hand, Jesus being a human being, uh, that went on for quite a while in the early church. Um, because it, it is simply taken for granted and stated in the Bible that Jesus is, he has these divine qualities, but he also has very human qualities at the same time. And the church had to, to uh, come to a point where they needed to debate and make a decision as to what do we really believe about this. Because there were several false teachings that sprung up during the first couple of centuries of Christianity. Those false beliefs included a denial of his divinity. Uh, some people said that Jesus was only a human being, a normal human being. He was born a, a normal human being. And then he was appointed later on to become divine or something like that. Um, or he was simply just a special human being who was appointed by God to represent him here on earth. Uh, and we refer to ebionism uh, over here, which is a false belief um, and is derived from the Hebrew word for poor, and that is that some, some poor human being uh, eventually became this God-appointed person. There is also the denial of his humanity. And he, he was God. He, he took on a seemingly human body, but he was never really a human. And uh, that is called docetism, from the word dokeo uh, in, uh, in Greek, which means to seem or to look like. And then uh, another false teaching that sprung up was that Christ was God, uh, who only occupied a human being, a human being by the name of Jesus. So there was a person by the name of Jesus who lived on earth, and then at the right end of the appointed time, God came and He then occupied this human being. Now, Gnosticism, and we have looked at this word before, it comes from the word gnosis, which means to know, um, is, is a whole, it was a whole system that reached uh, its pinnacle in the second century, uh, where many people were lured into a philosophy of Gnosticism. And they believed that through a, a process of knowing, or knowing more about God, you ultimately become God. I mean, that's just putting it very bluntly, and, uh, or, or very briefly. Uh, the, the human body is actually evil and sinful, and therefore Jesus never could have had a human body. Um, he occupied a human body, 
but ultimately he rejected the human body because he is God and, and God cannot live in a human body. That's uh, basically what they believe. And then the last one I just want to mention is that the Son of God, Jesus, was created by God. Uh, and that is a view of Arius, and it, it resulted in a whole view that was called Arianism in the early centuries, and the church uh, and several of the documents we have from early church fathers uh, tackled this particular issue, and that is that God was never, Jesus was never created. Uh, Jesus was pre-existent with God because He existed with the Trinity. And so it, it resulted in a teaching, a theology that we refer to as one person and two natures. The early debates um, came to this conclusion that Jesus is the only and most unique person ever. There will never be one like him. There has never been anybody like Jesus because in one single person and one single being, you have both God, divine nature, and human, human nature, dwelling in one person at the same time. Although Jesus was completely human, he never ceased to be God either. There was no one like him before, will never ever be anybody like him. Holding the two natures of Christ in tension is crucial for our understanding of Christ and for our own salvation. We have to believe that Jesus became a full human being. First John actually has several things to say about this. I, I just want to refer uh, to Timothy over here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul has something to say about this. And 1 Timothy 3.16, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He, Jesus, appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, preached among the nations, was believed in the world and taken up in glory. And John, the book of John, many people believe that you have the early uh, evidences here in uh, 1 John of Gnosticism. Uh, it, wasn't, it hasn't reached its full uh, ex expl ex explanation or full um, uh, uh, teachings yet, but you, you have the roots of Gnosticism in John, uh, or at least references to people who believe that the body is evil and Jesus couldn't have been a human being. In 1 John chapter 4, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh in other words, in human form, is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. As you continue, uh, this is John saying, you have to acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh, that he was a full human being. But as we go on in chapter 5 of John, he says, we also know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. He, Jesus, is the true God and eternal life. So in the same book, we have reference to the fact that Jesus is God and that Jesus is a human being. Now, this goes like the Trinity. It goes beyond our understanding how Jesus simultaneously can be God and human at the same time. We also need to recognize that Jesus, after His resurrection, continued to have a body. It is a resurrected body, a glorified body, but He continued to have a body. The disciples actually recognized Him after His resurrection. This body uh, could do many different things now. Uh, he was no longer limited to one single place. He was no longer limited to what flesh and blood can do and that is we can't walk through walls and doors and so on. But after his resurrection, Jesus was able to appear and to disappear, uh, but he was definitely recognizable by his disciples. Some of the names of Christ, the, the New Testament uses several names for Jesus. There is obviously the word Jesus in Greek, it is Jesus, and that is similar to the word for Isaiah that we find in the Old Testament, and it, it's related to the word Savior or to save. And so in the word Jesus, we find the word Savior. Now, it's a normal word. Many other people were called by the name Jesus. Uh, and even till today in Latin America, it's quite a popular name. Uh, 
uh, for people to be called Ye uh, Jesus or Jesus or however they pronounce that. Um, but it took on special significance in the New Testament when Jesus was given this particular name. The word Christ is the Greek word Christos, um, which is the Greek for Messiah or the saint or the anointed one. And so Jesus is the one sent from God or the anointed one. And uh, this Messiah that the Jews expected, Jesus then had that uh, name. The word Lord I've referred to already is the Greek translation for the Hebrew Adonai. It can also be the Greek translation for Yahweh. And then the Son of God emphasizing Jesus' divinity and the Son of Man emphasizing His humanity. And then the Word of God is another word that we find uh, for, for Jesus or another name that we find for Jesus. And Jesus is God's final revelation to us. Some more of the titles uh, for Jesus. He is called the Savior. He is God's means of salvation. He is called the Lamb of God uh, in John, in the Gospel of John, as well as the Lamb uh, who looks like He was slain in the book of Revelation. He is, the, he is God's sacrifice on our behalf. So Jesus became not only the Lamb on the altar, but also the priest, uh, according to Hebrews, uh, the one who offered the sacrifice. The I am statements are very clear. Uh, we don't have time to go through them right now, but I do encourage you to go and look up those I am statements. I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth, I am the resurrection, uh, and so on. The word Rabboni or Rabboni uh, means teacher, pointing to his divine authority. Uh, he was given the name Emmanuel, which means God with us uh, by the angel when he spoke to Mary. He is called the Lion of Judah. He is called the Son of David. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Um, one of the challenges that I want to leave with you is to go and find names for Jesus or titles of Jesus. And uh, it, every one of those titles will teach you more about the character and the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One. He fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah who was to come. In the Old Testament, three different offices uh, or positions uh, were appointed by anointing of oil. The one was a prophet, and in that sense, Jesus fulfilled the prophet, uh, the, prophe the prophecy about becoming the Word of God or the prophet. Uh, he is the Word of God, and he is, uh, he is also a priest. And in the Old Testament, a priest was anointed with oil, and Jesus became the high priest forever, especially the book of Hebrews has long sections about Jesus as, be, as being our priest. And Jesus also is the king. He's the ruler of all. And in the book of Revelation, we find him right on the right hand of the Father. We find him uh, around the throne uh, where he is ruler of all. During the intertestament period, the expectations for the coming Messiah was, were very, very high. And... Um, even among the Samaritans, the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, we know that Messiah was coming. And uh, she used the word uh, that the Samaritans referred to their Messiah expectation was Taheb. And she said, I know that the Taheb was coming. And Jesus said to her, essentially, I am he. You can look at me. I am that Messiah who came. The early Christians accepted that Jesus was God's promised Messiah. Some of the critical beliefs about Jesus. I've mentioned this already at the beginning, but let me just highlight that again. The divinity of Christ. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is part of God. He is the tr he's part of the Trinity. He is God. Uh, the moment you start fiddling with that belief, you're moving into false belief systems. His virgin birth is another thing that uh, primarily and essentially evangelicals affirm. And it's something we hold dear. It is something that we don't even want to begin to negotiate. It blows our minds, but there is nothing impossible for God. Only God can do this kind of thing. And I, I believe it is possible for God. And so I believe it's a truth that we need to hold on, on to very uh, dearly. The fact that He had a human body, His substitutionary death, the fact that He died in our place, and we'll talk a little bit more about this after the break. And then the resurrection of Christ, the fact that He rose from the dead, and that he is alive. Interesting that even in the book of Acts, when they replaced uh, Judas, uh, they said we need to find someone who can be a witness along with us of all the things that Jesus did, including the fact that he rose from the dead. And that became a very crucial doctrine 
Now, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then a lot of what we believe about Jesus would, would go by the wayside. And so we need to affirm that as well. The other thing we are affirming is that Jesus is coming again. Uh, the how and the when and, and all those kind of things we'll look at later on. Uh, but this is a very crucial belief of ours. Christ will return. Some of the symbols that we use for Jesus. Um, we use the fish symbol. Uh, the reason for that is goes all the way back to the New Testament. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. And so the word fisher uh, or fish and the symbol of a fish became very crucial for uh, people in, in the uh, early uh, Christian days. But then also the word ichthus, and perhaps I'll write this on the board for you uh, so you can see what it looks like. The word ichthus is fish. It stands for the word fish. But then if you look at the first letters of each of the, uh, you look at the letters making up uh, the word fish. Uh, this one stands for Iesus. Uh, I think you can, you can hear the E sound over there. And that is Jesus, obviously. This one is Christos. And so you will recognize that. Theos. Uh, and then Huios is the word for son. And so the son of God. And then the S stands for Soter, which is Savior. And so uh, in that word, the early Christians found a symbol that they could use to identify one another. Especially in times of persecution. And oftentimes they would sit at uh, what we may call today a restaurant or some place. Uh, and they would start chatting and they were not sure how to express uh, their, their status as a Christian and whether the person on, on the opposite side, opposite side is a Christian as well. And they would simply just draw a fish and then the other person would affirm uh, because this would make yourself known uh, as a Christian. Another symbol, um, and, and several scholars have written wonderful books on the centrality of the cross. But of all symbols, the early Christian church believed that the cross is the one it's a cross of shame, really. Uh, it wasn't a, a cross of victory, uh, not initially. It was, uh, that's the, the rudest way in which you could have died back then. Uh, but, but ultimately, the Christians believe that this is a symbol that identified them because that's where our Savior died uh, for our sins. The, the other symbol I want to highlight um, is, the we call it the Chiro, uh, and you may have seen this on top of churches especially, uh, it's something like that. And um, it is, uh, the, the X is a ch sound standing for, uh, well, the, it's the beginning letter of the word Christos. And the second one looks like a P, but it's pronounced like an R, a R in, uh, in Greek. And so it became an abbreviated version for Christos, for Christ. And so on church towers, oftentimes you will see uh, the Chiro uh, symbol. Alpha and Omega. Uh, oftentimes are used to refer to either God or to Jesus Christ. And it's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. Uh, and they represent the beginning and the end. Now before we look at the work of Christ, we're going to take a break. Uh, and then after the break, we'll look at the work of Christ and how it applies to our own lives. Well, welcome back. Uh, as we look at the work of Christ, we've uh, up to this point in time, we looked at the person of Jesus, who he is. Now we look at what he has done. We start with the Old Testament, obviously, and um, there is some known in the Old Testament about Jesus Christ. First of all, that he is the creator and that he was actively involved in creation. That is not entirely 100% clearly stated in the Old Testament, but when you look at the New Testament references, there's no doubt that Jesus was part of creation. In the Old Testament, we uh, we make a deduction when we look at uh, the reference to the creation of humankind. Let us make man. And we believe Jesus was part of that. Hebrews 1 uh, calls him the sustainer of the universe or creation. Um, and then the angel of the Lord. We've, we've talked about this before. And we can't say this with absolute certainty. But some scholars believe that there are times when the angel of the Lord... Uh, appears to a person or speaks to a person that it may be Jesus Christ. And we've looked at Abraham receiving some angels or some people initially. They turn out to be God and some angels, and we looked at that uh, last week. The New Testament, however, makes it abundantly clear 
that Jesus was active in the Old Testament. We have this reference that I referred to that I read earlier on right at the beginning. And uh, perhaps you kind of wondered uh, as I was doing that in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. And it says, um, He, Jesus, was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit, through whom He also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, in the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Now, I, I, I will tell you, and I need to tell you, that there are many different uh, interpretations of that particular reference. In fact, it found its way into the, uh, the Apostles' Creed uh, with this kind of statement. The statement says, we believe in Jesus and so on, and He died and He rose from the dead, and He went to hell, or He descended to hell. That's the way, and that's based on, on this particular verse. And so there are many interpretations of this. One interpretation is that Jesus uh, went after his resurrection during that time when he was coming and going and he wasn't uh, with the disciples all the time. That during that time he went to Hades or to the, uh, the underworld uh, to make an announcement about his victory over death and evil and so on. There, is, there are other possible interpretations and there are several around. The one that I personally like most is the fact that uh, Jesus in and through Noah preached to the people who are now dead and obviously now they are spirits or they are dead and referred to as spirits. Um, and I don't have time to elaborate on that particular issue. But Peter also says uh, in a different place how Jesus operated in the past and in the Old Testament era via the spirit he operated and he preached and he worked and ministered as well. And so Jesus was definitely active in the Old Testament. Um, as I said to you, the Old Testament doesn't make that very clear, but from a New Testament perspective, we can put the picture together. When we talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in a young girl, Mary, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, born in Bethlehem, the city of David, uh, and this is where the Jews often got it wrong uh, because they believed that the Messiah was going to be the son of David and therefore born uh, and he, he, he therefore comes from Bethlehem. It's amazing how God orchestrated events with a census being held and uh, Joseph and Mary had to travel all the way from Nazareth in the north down to just a few uh, miles south of Jerusalem and um, in the city of Bethlehem at the time Jesus was born. And so that... Uh, became that that was fulfilled and he was born on a date probably not the 25th of December um, we, we actually don't know when Jesus was born uh, that particular date was never kept for us uh, but somewhere along the line the the tradition arose and I personally had, don't have any massive problem with the 25th of December. I know that there are some Christians who believe this, it was a pagan festival and we, we now need to stay clear and blah, blah, blah. I, I actually don't have a problem because I celebrate that as the coming of Jesus into this world. And whether it is the 25th of December or the 25th of July, I couldn't care less. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is I want to celebrate the fact that Jesus was born uh, into this world. From the announcement of his conception to the circumstances around his birth, it was clear that Jesus was special. The titles given to him, uh, Messiah, Son of God, uh, Emmanuel, uh, it, it's, it's a list as long as my arms, uh, as my arm, if you go into the New Testament and start making a list of the different names of Jesus. And uh, as I did earlier on, I want to challenge you to make that list and use them to worship uh, Jesus and to get to know him better. In terms of his life and ministry, he grew up in the home of Joseph and Mary in the town of Nazareth. If you go there now uh, to Nazareth today, uh, you will find a church, a fairly modern church built over the place where they believe Jesus grew up. Uh, there is inside the church at the bottom of that, there's a, there's a grotto, like a cave. Uh, and back in those days, oftentimes homes were built with a cave in the background, as it were. So they would, they would identify a cave that is livable and they would build some structure in front of that. And whether that's the exact spot, we will no longer know necessarily, but it's definitely in that, close to that vicinity where he grew up. At the age of about 30, he was baptized in the Jordan River by John, and then he ministered in Galilee, Judea, Samaria, 
And only on a few occasions did Jesus leave the area to go to other regions, either on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, on occasion he went to uh, Tyre and Sidon region, preached about the kingdom of God, uh, meaning that God wants to rule and God wants to reign over this world. God wants to re-establish what He created in the first instance, and Jesus came to do all of that. And through His preaching uh, and through His life, He demonstrated the kingdom of God, God's rule. God rules over illness. God rules over our bodies. God rules over demons. So casting out demons was part of the way that God's rule was announced by Jesus. Uh, and then sharing the good news of forgiveness with Him. People were bound by sin and terrible sin sometimes. Uh, a woman who had seven demons in her. And Jesus casting out the demons and, and setting her free and forgiving her sins. And several times Jesus said to a person, Your faith uh, has healed you. Go in freedom and don't sin anymore. And, and so, so in, in all of what Jesus did here on earth, during His life on earth, His ministry on earth, He was demonstrating the kingdom of God. And then the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, coming to the end of His life, Jesus was arrested and uh, through a very, very unfair trial uh, before the Jewish authorities, he was handed over to Pilate uh, and then condemned to die a death on a cross, which was the most cruel way of dying And back in those days. Uh, he died a brutal physical death. Uh, he was definitely dead. And that's another false teaching that sprung up somewhere along the line that Jesus only had some kind of a, a, a seeming death, but he wasn't really dead, and therefore he just came back uh, a, a few days later. Uh, but he was certainly declared death, and the, the, um, the blood and the water that came out when he was uh, pierced uh, was an indication of the fact that he was definitely dead. He was crucified on a Friday. He rose on a Sunday. Um, and it just raises a slight little issue in the mind of some, minds of some people. At one stage, Jesus said, and I believe he was referring to, an ins, to, a, to a concept, not the exact days. He said, as Jonah was in the fish for three days and three nights. Now, Jesus was not in the grave for three days and three nights. Uh, if, you, if you do your, your maths, he died on the Friday. Before the evening, he was buried. So that's Friday night, the whole of Saturday and then Sunday morning, early, early Sunday morning, he rose from the dead and he was no longer there. So it was only two nights and one full day when you really come to think of it. But in the minds of the people back then, it, it, it was not an issue. It was, it was a three-day span. So from a Friday, the Saturday, and the Sunday. Uh, and that's the time that Jesus uh, was dead and he spent time in the, in the grave. Then he appeared to many of his disciples and others as well. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the resurrection. He himself also saw Jesus, and so they became witnesses of the fact that Jesus uh, is alive and that he was alive, that he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and he promised to return 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, he was taken up into heaven. Uh, we refer to that as the ascension. He promised that he would return. Uh, many different places Jesus talks about that. I'm going to prepare a place, and when I have done so, I'll come back and take you to be with me. The angels, when they appear to uh, the disciples in Acts chapter 1, said, just as he went, he will come back again. And, and throughout the New Testament, the teaching is very clearly that Jesus is coming back. The early church anticipated Jesus' imminent return. In other words, he was going to come back in their life, lifetime. That was how they lived, and that's what they preached. Now, Jesus didn't. We know it because we live 2,000 years later. Uh, and the time of his coming is still not known. Even the Son of Man, I said earlier on, did not know at the time. It raises another little issue in my mind, and that is, does Jesus know now, being part of God uh, and, and being part of the Trinity? Um, and I don't know the answer to that question. It, it may be a theoretical question only at this stage. But I, I do know while he was on earth, as the Son of Man on earth, he didn't know the time of the coming. The book of Revelation confirms in no uncertain terms that Jesus is coming back. Even the prayer at the end of the book, uh, come back, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come. Uh, and it's something that we still anticipate uh, even today. Now, when we then talk about that's what Jesus did, for us. That's the work of Christ. Now, the work of Christ, as it uh, is implemented and worked out in our own lives, we talk about salvation. 
And the study is, and I have had it on the board before, uh, it's still there, Ichthus, the, the last letter is S, and it stands for Soter. Uh, and Soter means salvation or savior. And so Soteriology, and you can see the word there, Soter means salvation, and Soteriology means the study of salvation. And that is how Jesus' work that he has done is applied to our lives and to sinners. Um, and, and in the next few moments, I'm, I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about the way that salvation is working out in our lives. And we will be looking at several different uh, concepts. Most of them are theological concepts. But it is, it's wonderful when you start thinking about and understanding what it is that Jesus came to do uh, for us. Salvation was brought about by Jesus. His life, His birth, His life, His death, resurrection, ascension are not just interesting. Sometimes I get a little bit disturbed by some of the Christmas cards. Uh, they are so cute uh, and so dainty about the oh, little baby in a little cribby somewhere and, and so on. And, and really, it just, it just talks about the niceties of Jesus' birth. But we can never talk about Jesus' birth. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily that nice either. Uh, the picture in my mind is of a very rough circumstance of people who couldn't find a place to stay, and eventually they ended up in a place where they were probably surrounded by animals or maybe they were in the vicinity. Um, and, and Jesus' birth was a very real and probably a very painful experience for Mary uh, and for Joseph. But when you think about the birth, you need to think about his life. You need to think about his death, his resurrection, and ascension. Uh, you, you can't think about Jesus unless you think about all of these events making up the coming of Jesus into this world, God entering into our humanity in order to save us from the fall of mankind. There is another mysterious fact about this, and that is that God planned this from before the creation of the world, before the creation of the universe. I said to you several times now that God moves beyond time. And therefore, God was, he's, He is eternal from the beginning, and God is, will be eternal uh, until the end. He is just an eternal being. And, and God is not bound by time and by history. Uh, and therefore, before time, God already decided to bring Jesus into this world. Now, that in a certain sense is a mystery to me, but also a comfort to me. Because when I read through the Old Testament, God did not plan something. It didn't work out. That was plan A. And then he changed his mind and said, okay, well, let's scrap that plan. Let's go to plan B. Jesus is plan A. And it's something that you and I really need to understand. Otherwise, we will have this concept that there is really an Old Testament salvation and the Jews can get to heaven in a different way. And there are, then there is New Testament salvation. This is Jesus dying for us. And, and, and now we, we go to heaven because we believe in Jesus. Actually, at the end of the day, there's only one salvation plan of God. God progressively worked His way through that plan, but the plan was Jesus, to bring Jesus into this world. Ephesians 1.4 says very clearly that I was elected before the creation of the universe. Uh, whatever, we'll talk about the doctrine of election uh, sometime later. But that means that, that I was planned by God before the creation of the world, and my salvation was planned by Him. That means that Jesus uh, coming to this world was planned by God from eternity. It is through faith in Christ's Incarnation is the word we use for his becoming a human being, his death and resurrection that we come into a right and the right relationship with God. One of the concepts and one of the first concepts I want to introduce uh, to us tonight is the word atonement or the concept of atonement. Because sin separates us from God, we are unable to save ourselves. And uh, uh, this is something that we all know very well. We, we know that we've tried and we have failed. It is only by Jesus and what He did on the cross that we can be saved. And the concept that we use to explain that is the word atonement. That, that to bring us into a relationship with someone uh, with whom we, we are in enmity. That concept is atonement. Uh, bringing us into a harmonious relationship with someone else. During the Old Testament era, the sacrificial system provided albeit a temporary, but it provided the means of atonement. It provided us with the way in which we approached God, as it were. 
but it had to be repeated again and again and, and again and again. And that's the point that the book of Hebrews is making. But Jesus came and he now paid the full price. He was the final sacrifice on the altar. And he paid the final price and thereby, thereby he atoned for our sins once and for all. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11 and others. The other concept is justification. Uh, you've heard this concept many times before. It is a legal term that talks about my standing before a judge uh, or in terms of the law. When I transgress the law, then I have stepped out of line and I am no longer just or justified. And therefore, I need something uh, to help me become, uh, in, to, to, to get into the right relationship uh, with the law and with society around me. Sins have separated us from God. And we have been sentenced to death. This is all legal terminology. And, and already I have been sentenced to death um, because of my sins. But Jesus came into this world and because I couldn't pay the penalty for my own sins, Jesus paid the penalty on my behalf. And now when I place my faith, my trust in Him, I am then declared just by God. And we call it justification or justification by faith. And that particular doctrine, this particular doctrine, became a, a very, very important way in which the Reformation, uh, the truth in the Reformation was emphasized. And it changed the face of the church uh, for a long while. So the Reformers brought this along, Martin Luther and others, where looking at the, at the letter of Romans in particular, uh, came to this understanding that I have no standing before God. Jesus came between me and God. He took my sins upon Himself. And because of what Jesus did, I am declared just by God. And we call that justification by faith. By placing my faith in God or in Jesus, I am declared just by God. The word reconciliation, I don't think many of us struggle with this word. Again, it's separation between two parties. Uh, I have been estranged from my Creator because sin came into my life. It resulted in guilt, shame, and condemnation. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Immediately when Adam and, and Eve sinned, they knew something is wrong. They, they, they started covering themselves up. They blamed one another. They hid from God. Uh, uh, it affected their relationship. And, uh, and, and, and that is condemnation. And when Jesus came into this world through His death, he brought us back into a harmonious relationship with God. He reconciled us with God. So the Bible talks about sinners being reconciled with God. I have been reconciled with God because Jesus died for me. The word propitiation, which we find in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, uh, relates to this particular uh, issue over here. And uh, it, it may be necessary for us just to have a look at that. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, he says, My children, I write this to you, that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that word, atoning sacrifice over there, um, is sometimes translated by the word, propitiation. It's not in my normal vocabulary. I can guarantee you that. I don't use that on a regular basis when I speak to Joan. Uh, you know, we need some propitiation here or something like that. But um, it certainly is a word that helps me understand that Jesus is the one who died for us and He is the atoning sacrifice. He is that go-between. And through that, uh, I have divine favor, not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus did on the cross by removing our guilt. Another word, again, I don't think we have major difficulty understanding this, uh, but the New Testament talks about our adoption by God. As God's creation, we are part of God's family. Generally speaking, we belong to the family of God in the sense that we reflect the image of God. It is a broken image of God, and therefore we have been estranged from God. And uh, the Bible also talks about being children of the devil, Jesus accused the Jews, the Jews in inverted commas, of being children of the devil because they listened to the devil. So if you listen to the devil, you obey the devil, you do what the devil wants, you're a child of the devil. And so we then in the, 
in the kingdom of darkness. Through Jesus' death, He brought us from the kingdom of darkness into what the Bible talks about as His marvelous light, the kingdom of His marvelous light. And sin brought the vision and enmity, causing us to be on the, so on the side of darkness. But through the death of Jesus and by faith in Him, we are brought into the kingdom of God. And this wonderful picture, and some people do have a problem psychologically with that, uh, but the wonderful picture that God becomes my father. I no longer have to serve the devil. I don't obey the devil anymore. I obey Jesus. I obey God. I'm a child of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 mentions that. And I have read uh, from um, uh, Romans before as well in Romans chapter 8. Uh, we, we have the concept that we are heirs of God and we can call God Abba. Father, Abba is, a, is an Aramaic word for like daddy. It's a it's a it's a, a, a relationship type word where we come into that close relationship with God. The concept of election. Um, this is something that blows our minds really when we when we come to think of that, and uh, we we're trying to get into the mind of God uh, when we start talking about the doctrine of election. But the fact of the matter is that God chose us as Christians. Those who belong to God have been chosen by God to belong to Him. We have been chosen, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, even before the foundation of the earth, before the creation. This statement has led to many, many debates, ranging from what we sometimes call hyper-Calvinism. And Calvin had a whole uh, a theological description of how uh, God operates. Um, it's sometimes using the acronym TULIP, uh, meaning that, that God has selected us, He's elected us, He, uh, he talks about irresistible grace, the perse perseverance of the saints, um, and, and the fact that, that God has uh, unconditionally elected us to be His own. Some people have taken that into the extreme, uh, where they basically say that Jesus died only for the elect, in other words, and, and ultimately that will be true, because their argument is that Jesus didn't die for nothing. He wouldn't die for a thousand people and only a hundred of them become Christians, sort of thing. And therefore he wastes his blood on 900 people who never become Christians. And therefore the argument is, theoretically speaking, Jesus only really died for a hundred because those are the ones who became Christian. Um, and, and so we have hyper-Calvinism uh, uh, theories and theologies where it is on the one extreme where God did everything. He picked and cho chose certain people and certain people he died for and others he, he created to go to hell, essentially. And, and that is hyper-Calvinism. On the other end of the, spe the spectrum uh, of that continuum, we have Arminianism, uh, after, named after a man by the, by the name of Arminius who believe that human, humans have complete freedom um, and God is offering on a, on a plate salvation and it's my choice. I pick and choose whether I want to belong to God or I don't want to belong to God. And again, if you, if you overemphasize either of those, then you get into extremes. And then we have views all the way on that spectrum in between. And uh, at the end of the day, it's not for me to tell you what you should believe in this regard. We probably represent different views even in this room today. My only plea would be that we talk about election in Jesus Christ. We cannot talk about election for the world out there. I have no idea. When I look at a thousand people who aren't Christians, I have no idea who, who, uh, which of those will ever become Christian. I can only talk about the Christian. Once a person is a Christian, I can tell you that person is elect. Uh, I heard an illustration, I believe it was told by Spurgeon many years ago, uh, where he said, there's a door, and on the outside of the door, as I stand and I look at the outside of the door, there's an open invitation for anybody to enter through the door. Once I enter through the door, and I look behind myself, I look back, on the door, on the inside of the door, it says, you are elect. That's the only way we can ever talk about election. We can only talk about people who are Christians who are elect. Uh, ultimately, when, when we get to heaven one day and this world comes to an end, then we will know that certain people and we will then be able to name them and number them. 
They are the elect of God because they're in heaven. Those who have not been elected or those who end up in hell, uh, those are the ones who rejected God um, and they will be judged by God. And therefore we have to say they have not been elected by God. How that works in God's mind, uh, I, I don't know. And I think probably that's enough about election. What are the benefits for sinners? Well, Jesus died to give his life for us. And I have forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. Um, I, I can go on and preach about this, but my original sin has been taken away, and even the actual sins that I have committed have been wiped out and away. When God steps into my life through Jesus, then He forgives every single sin that I have ever committed. It, it may mean that I need to still do some restitution, is a word we often use for that, and that is I may need to go and sort out certain things. I can't just steal money put it in my pocket and go and say, please, Lord, forgive me because I've stolen some money. Now, the Lord will say, okay, I will forgive you, but now you take the money back. And you may even have to pay penalties on that money. So that's the after effect of sin. Some of the effects of sin will still be with us and will ever be with us. I, I cannot abuse my, bo my body through drugs, accept Jesus as my Savior, and now say, well, Jesus has now forgiven all my sins, or God has forgiven all my sins, and now my body is completely healed. I probably will suffer for the rest of my life because I've done damage to my physical body. Similarly, I can't kill a person and then say, Lord, please forgive me. I'm in prison now. Please forgive me. And then the prison authorities say, okay, you may go because you're now a Christian. We'll have loads and loads of prisoners become Christians if that were true. I will still continue to pay the penalty in terms of murdering someone, but God forgives me in terms of my standing before God, I am forgiven. Similarly, God comes into my life and He offers me peace. I have been reconciled with God. I don't fear anymore. I don't live in fear anymore. I live, in, I live with peace in my heart. And God wants me to live in peace with Him. He wants me to live with peace with people around me. Freedom, sin has kept me captive. The devil has kept us captive. And God has come through Jesus and freed us. And so we can live in freedom. We have freedom. We have freedom even from the law in the Old Testament. And that was a major issue when Paul and others wrote to the Christians in the New Testament era. Uh, because they, many of the Jews struggled over this issue of how the law still applies to me. Now, I've been freed of the legalistic side of the law. But there's certain principles we find in the law that are still as much applicable to us today as they were to the Jews back then. For them it resulted in a legalistic requirement. For us it, re it results in how do I apply this principle in my own life in order to bring glory and honor to God and to look after His kingdom. A sense of belonging. When God comes into my life, we talked about adoption. God adopts us into the family. And now I belong. I belong to God. I no longer have to run away from Him. I have that assurance of eternal life and salvation. There are many debates among Christians when it comes to Christology and soteriology. The doctrine of election is one, and I've spoken about that a little bit already. Do humans have a say or a choice in their decision to follow Christ, or don't they? And uh, I, I already said to you, we have the whole spectrum uh, of people who, who overemphasize um, the fact that I have zero say. Um, it's called irresistible grace. In other words, God comes when He saves me. I don't have a single say in that. And, and other Christians say, but, but can it really work like that? Don't I have some kind of freedom? Do I have the freedom to sin? If I have the freedom to sin, surely I have the freedom to choose salvation as well. And then people overemphasize the choice that I have, and that is uh, I can simply uh, disregard God uh, in what He does. And there's a bit of a mystery there that is very difficult for us to, uh, to solve. And then how do we explain God's sovereignty and salvation and the human freedom of choice? Predestination is another word that we haven't even looked at yet, but it means that the outcome of my life in terms of salvation has been predetermined. I am predestined for either hell or for heaven. And, and uh, again, people balk at this, uh, at this whole theology of predestination. Uh, can, can I do that perhaps on the basis of God's foreknowledge? Uh, personally, I would be a little bit more comfortable with that sort of approach or angle. Uh, 
Uh, and in this regard, I just want to read you the start of First Peter chapter 1. And Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. I am personally very comfortable with the doctrine of election and predestination, especially based on the foreknowledge of God. Because God knows everything. If, he, if God planned Jesus' death on the cross before the creation of the world, world then God also, Ephesians 1.4, planned my election. But He did it according to Peter, based on his foreknowledge. Now again, as I said to you, people argue about that uh, on a whole spectrum. And then eternal security, a huge debate. Um, and it has to do with whether a Christian can lose his or her, her salvation. And um, volumes and volumes of books have been written uh, fighting for either one of the two. And that is, uh, a Christian, once you, know, once, you rec once you are saved by God, um, it's called perseverance of the saints, um, you, you can never lose your salvation. Other Christians are saying, mm, you can't, you know, can you ever say that? I mean, can you turn your back on God and you can still be saved? Well, the counter-argument is, has that person ever been saved in the first instance? And, you know, so it goes on and on and on. The one thing that I want to say is that I have zero doubt about my salvation. As I stand here before you, I know that I know that I'm saved. Not because of who I am, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. And because of what I find in this book, the Bible says that if you accept Jesus and you confess Him as Lord and Savior, you are His child. The next thing that I need to do is to look at the fruit in my life, to see that my life is producing the kind of fruit that prove that I am now rooted in Jesus Christ. And uh, if, if that is true, and I believe Jesus and His Word, I take Him at His Word, and that is, I know that I'm a Christian. I don't live in fear. I don't live in uncertainty. Ooh, will I lose my salvation? I don't even live like that. Because I know that God has done the work in my life, and when He does, He does a perfect work uh, in my life. A couple of errors related to Christology. Uh, I mention Mormons by name because they don't believe that, God, that Jesus is God's final revelation. John chapter 1 verse 1 says that Jesus is God's word. Colossians 1 19, that Jesus is the image of God. Hebrews chapter 1, that God finally spoke through Jesus. He is the final prophet. Now, Mormons believe that Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Smith is a further revelation and a better revelation, and therefore the Book of Mormon contains more revelation, in fact, more perfect revelation, and they're more into the Book of Mormon than they are into the Bible. And so I, I, I highlight that specifically because I believe it's a false teaching, and therefore Jesus, uh, I, I believe that Jesus is God's final revelation. Similarly, I need to mention to you Jehovah's Witnesses because they do not believe that Jesus is God. One of the strongest arguments that they have, and I'm not going to bore you with the Greek grammar over here, but in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now they say the translation, because there is no article uh, in front of that. And when there is no article in the Greek, then generally speaking it is possible to translate that with uh, with, with no article. In other words, to say there is that the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. In other words, indefinite. And that's the way they translate that in their version of the Bible, that Jesus was a God, but He was not God. Uh, and they don't believe in the Trinity. Um, there is only one God, and that's where the word Jehovah comes from, which is what I told you before, is actually a wrong uh, pronunciation of the word Yahweh, be it as it may, uh, they believe that also that they're the only ones who are saved. They also believe that there will be a special brand of Christians and they will make up 144,000 in heaven one day. And that only if you work hard enough that you will be part of that special brand and everybody else will be below them. And in fact, if you're not really a Jehovah's Witness, then you won't be saved either. Um, and so um, 
my response to that is that there is plenty of evidence in the Bible that Jesus is God. It's not just John chapter 1. Uh, there are plenty of other places where Jesus is mentioned as God. Christadelphians, you probably have never even come across these people, but they say that Jesus was a normal man who was later made or he later became God. Um, the response to that is that Jesus is pre-existent and he's part of the Trinity from, from eternity. Uh, and as God, he came into this world, took on the human nature or a new human form, and he remained God and human at the same time, which is a doctrine I tried to explain to you earlier on. I mention these because they are modern versions of several of the doctrines that arose, uh, false doctrines that arose in the first couple of centuries of Christianity. But here they are, people who will knock on your door, and I have had them knock on my door several times. The way I respond, uh, especially to Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, um, I, I, said, I say to them, you are most welcome to come in, but I want you to know I am a Christian. I want you to know that I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and based on what He did on the cross for me, I am a Christian, and I believe I'm saved. You're welcome to come in and, I, and to explain to me what you want to explain, and then I'm going to pray for you. And more often than not, they say, thank you, but no thank you, and they leave. Um, the, the last thing that you want to do is to get into an argument. You're not going to win these people with an argument. They have memorized certain arguments. I've had uh, people in my home where they don't, they don't even listen to what I'm saying. They have a particular memorized version, and they just go on and on and on, uh, and it's almost no use getting into an argument with them. So those are errors related to uh, Christianity or Christology. Docetism, Jesus only seemed to have had a human body. Um, that goes all the way back. Uh, there may still be versions of that around. Uh, we talked about that. And then the error of pluralism. Uh, and that is pretty much with us today. In fact, probably one of the biggest dangers for us as Christians. And that is that Jesus is only one of many roads that lead us to God. Uh, the Bible is clear. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way. No one can come to the Father but by me. And um, if you start believing that there are many other ways uh, and that, that any and all other religions somehow will get to God, um, then we shouldn't do any missions. Uh, and, and this is foundational for a few weeks from now. We we'll look at the church and the church's role in this world. And if you believe in pluralism, then a lot of what we say in this course will make no sense uh, whatsoever. There's a hymn about Christ and it says, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. And uh, we know that hymn very well. Uh, a more modern song, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life. And I am in that place once again. I want to challenge you as you go to church and you worship to look at the words of the song and how it will affirm so many of the things that we talk about uh, in this course. I want you to read not only the prescribed work but the, uh, the chapters I refer to in Revelation and then take time to contemplate the names and the titles of Jesus. I said that a few times tonight. But just take time to really think about who Jesus is. And then the names and, 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 and uh, meditate on the names of Christ. And use them uh, to bring out the character of Jesus or the work of Jesus that he has done uh, for us. And next week we'll look at uh, the, role, the person and the role of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives. And so enjoy your freedom in Christ this week. May the Lord bless you.